Welcome in here to wrap up the weekend edition of the Coral Economics Report. Corey and I are chatting with Marin Katusa right now. Marin is uh, an interesting man to say the least. Uh, married to the second most beautiful woman in the world, Kathy, I have to say. Marin is our go-to guy whenever we have questions about energy. And, you know, we've got some interesting situations going on right now, Marin, in the uh, in the energy sector. Gold is going down in price. Uh, give us an opinion. I mean, what, what do we have to look forward to over the next year or so? Well, from the equity side of things, especially when we talk about junior resources, we're already seeing consolidation. And if you're invested in the right management teams, which have picked the right projects and have the right financial discipline and financial balance sheet, in two to three years, you're going to be adding an extra zero to that share worth. So uh, it's already started, and we're now even seeing the much larger companies, such as a Cisco, after they've worked out their kinks in their production, Gold Corp comes around and takes them out. So that's number one catalyst. Trying to take them out. Well... The word on the street, it's going to happen. So, you know, I, that's just a good example of what's going to happen. We're going to see many more of those. Uh, moving forward, energy has been a fantastic place to be in. And the reality is, is that the world over the last five years has been able to deal with north of $90 per barrel of oil. And the reality is, is the turmoil in the Middle East, proof Syria, it's not going away. So even though the Americans in Iran are talking about settling there's so many of the, my, the devils in the details. They still haven't even agreed to the definition of enrichment of uranium. So we're far away from peace in the Middle East. So there's a lot of risks available to the investor for more catalysts on the upside for the energy sector. Marin, we've talked about energy quite a bit with you. And you were, along with a couple other people, really turned me bullish on uranium. I believe it was about two to three years ago, really saying, you know what, this uranium is going to perform very well. It still seems to me to be struggling a little bit. There are some, some stories, some news from around the world of, of countries not moving back into uranium as quickly as we thought that they would. Do you see this changing this year, or what do you think will be the driving force to change that? The number one driving force, of course, is Japan, and they have all 54 nuclear reactors offline. Then South Korea has their reactors on offline, and Germany and Italy are planning to reduce their nuclear generation. So 2013 was a very interesting year where you had the largest influx of spot uranium sales in the last 50 years. And that was because so much excess uranium that wasn't going to be used in Japan or Korea hit the markets. On top of that, in the North American markets, you have Southern Edison, California, shut down San Onofre, and that made available 10 million pounds of uranium hit the spot market. And on top of that, the big white elephant that nobody's talking about is in July of 2013, the DOE, under Obama's first chance to change the rules, changed two major issues with the uh, uranium agreement, which was the DOE historically never sold more than 10% of uranium into the market. And number two is any sales cannot impede domestic production cash costs. Well, they sold well over 10%, so they said there's no more 10% rule. 42 million pounds is used in the U.S. every year. Historically, they would sell up to 4.2. Last year, they just sold under 6 million pounds. So this year, they're already going to sell anywhere between 5 to 7 million pounds. They have to generate a quarter billion dollars a year from the uranium sales to pay for the cleanup and all the different, in the past, legacy issues. And the other issue is at 3450, there is no domestic uranium production that can make money. That's the good thing. You see, because there, again, there's going to be a consolidator in the sector, and we've been red hot by picking the right companies, and you can see the management teams that know these things, and you can make a lot of money, and who's going to be the company that consolidates the U.S. ISR production? That company is going to be a big, big score in the next 24 months. Marin, we have an awful lot of folks on our website, in our forum, who are deathly afraid of this, still, I have to say, deathly afraid of the situation in Fukushima. Now, an interesting story, I was working out down at the club where we belong, and they happened to have a uh, conference going on, interestingly enough, an environmental conference going on. I was talking to a young man who was attending that conference, and I said, so what do you know about Fukushima? And he said, it's the most overblown situation, in my opinion, that exists in the world today. I don't think it's that big a deal. What do you think? 
I would disagree with that comment. I think it is a real serious issue. Um, I've got a lot of close colleagues involved in it directly. Um, and the reality is if it, you, you have to work not just the technical issues, but also the sentiment in Japan. And, and emotions is the most difficult thing to translate so, or change. And you know, most people in the uranium sector expected Japan to at least bring on a few of the nuclear reactors by this time. You know, Fukushima happened in early February of 2011. We're now touching early February of 2014, so we're almost on the third anniversary and nothing's changed. So I think if we don't see the nuclear reactors come online by the end of 2014, we have to reevaluate what's going on with Japan. I don't see that being the case. I just believe that they have no choice but to bring back the reactors because of basic economics. Remember, this is a place that had uh, Hiroshima happen to them. Uh, you know, the economics will prevail. I think that's a great comment, Marin, because what we hear about uranium and a lot of these other different energies is the environmental impact that they will have, the same thing that we hear about mining. But the fact of the matter is, if the economics, if the economics take charge and become the forefront, these things are going to go through because they have to, to keep growing these economies. We will need energy and where else are we going to get some of this energy? I don't think there are other alternatives out there that can take over for what uranium does in our world. Well, that's a, you're right. You look at the U.S., one in five homes is powered by nuclear energy and, you know, Al, I'll give you the biggest short that could happen in the next five years in the history of energy. Two countries consume half of the world's LNG production right now. That's Japan and South Korea. What if Japan does bring the reactors on faster than everyone expects and these hundreds of billions of dollars going into the LNG sector globally, which is built on no nuclear reactors coming on, what would happen then to the LNG sector? That would probably be one of the safest investments I ever made in my life. But having said that, what it hinges on in my mind, I mean, I'm not an expert at all in your industry, but what it hinges on in my mind is will Japan be able to bring those reactors back? You know, you go to one new source and they say it's absolutely impossible. You go to another new source and they say the problem is overblown. It's not impossible at all. I think the truth is somewhere in between. It's going to take longer than we expected. We've already realized that, but it will happen. The cost of cleanup will be much more expensive than originally planned. But again, economics will prevail, and Japan cannot afford the most expensive electricity costs in the world. Well, they absolutely can't. Marin, getting back to what you do on a daily basis here, what are you writing about for Casey Research right now? Right now, we just finished literally a, a special report on uranium that is coming out. will be published at the end of January. And then we're coming out with another special report on uh, South American uh, shale oil opportunities. So, Marin, if people are looking at investing in a couple companies, you're saying that uranium might be the play, or are you saying that a couple other industries out there could be where to look? Well, look, the energy sector dwarfs the mining sector. So, you know... Uranium is just the one subsector in the energy matrix, and I think to be a good and successful energy speculator and investor, you need a diversified energy investment. Um, that said, there are some very compelling arguments in certain companies in the uranium sector, but investors must be very aware to stay away from others. For example, I would not touch an African producer or an African explorer in uranium right now because the reality is the costs are too high. Too high in Africa. Yeah, so look, Paladin's a perfect example. The debt is crippling them. They're going to go bankrupt soon. Again, economics prevail. Numbers don't lie. So if I was an investor in uranium, I would focus on North America. Because the reality is, is where's the number one nuclear generation in the U.S.? Who's the largest importer of uranium in the world? It's not China. It's the U.S. So that's where the opportunity is. And yet, some of the lowest cost production in the world is in North America. 
I have always been a bit of a bull on uranium. Uh, did pretty well in it in the past. Why do I like uranium? For one simple reason. I like uranium because energy is the circulatory system of this planet. And I have to tell you, without blood, the planet is, the planet is definitely, definitely going to perish. Marin, thank you so much, bud. My pleasure.